All right, welcome to my podcast. Today, my guest is Kevin Mitchell. He's an associate professor of genetics and neuroscience at Trinity College, Dublin. And he recently published the book called Free Agents, How Evolution Gave Us Free Will. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks, Walter. Thanks very much. Yeah, and why don't we just dive right in? Give us okay. a quick pitch of how you think free will evolved. The quick pitch. Uh, that's a challenge because it, the, there's a reason it took a whole book to, to make the case here. But um, the basic pitch is that through evolution, organisms got uh, the control, managed to, to accumulate causal power to maintain themselves in the world. Um, that's really what it means to be an organism, is to hold yourself apart from the world, um, to, to not be in just in equilibrium with the environment. And so organisms are organized in order to do that. And one good way to do that is to be able to adapt to changes in the world. So if you want to keep yourself persisting, you may have to change uh, your configuration or you may have to change something in the world to, hmm. uh, or your position in the world in order to keep persisting. So that if, if food runs out in one place, you might have to move, for example. So behavior is basically an extended kind of form of homeostasis, of keeping yourself organized. And, um, and so the evolution of behavior gave organisms the power, these control systems, to um, adapt to changing circumstances, not in a stimulus response kind of a way, but in a holistic way where the organism integrates all the sort of information about what's out in the world and then does something to better its position, basically, that makes it more likely to, to stay alive. And as, as evolution progressed, of course, we developed control systems like nervous systems, which are brilliant for doing that, hmm. um, which allow us to sense things in the world, to learn about things in the world, to understand um, lots of contingencies and causal relations and so on, to build up that kind of knowledge and, and understanding to allow us to figure out what we should do in different circumstances and to um, basically let organisms use that causal power, accumulate the causal power that's, that, that comes from, um, from learning, from a history of causal intervention in the world, hmm. to give them the, the potential to keep themselves going by acting, by acting in the world. So, so that's the, I mean, that's the very quick two-minute pitch. <laughs> it's, really, it's really a story of the evolution of control systems. Right. And the, I mean, the key sort of points with respect to arguments about free will are that it's the organism itself that has control. That's the locus of control. Mm. It's not being pushed around by things in the environment. It's causally insulated, but it's also not just being pushed around by things inside it. There aren't just isolated bits of it that when they're active, make the organism do something. Um, instead, it's the organism using all that machinery mm. In our case, it's neural machinery, it's bits of our brains, to decide what to do. So that that pushes back against the idea that some people um, argue, where you know some people would say, well, look, neuroscience is revealing all these things in your brain that are active when you're making a decision. So really, it's just those circuits making the decision. You know, you get eliminated from that picture. So really, what I want to do is naturalize the idea that organisms as entities, as whole cells can have real causal power that's not a, a mirage, that's not an illusion, um, but that is a, a core element of what makes living things different from non-living. Mm. So that's quite interesting, because obviously if you talk about organisms here, generally, it seems like you might almost want to say that single-cell organisms, if they have autonomy and agency, that we should also ascribe free will to them. Yeah, so I don't Where go that do you draw far. the line? <laughs> <laughs> I don't go that far, but I'll, but also I don't like to draw a line. I don't yeah. think there is a bright line. I mean, evolution is a, is a process, right? Mm. And so for me, um, I would look at, you know, things like bacteria, the simplest uh, yeah. organisms that we know about. And when you look at their behavior, you can see it's purposeful, it's goal-directed, um, it's integrative and holistic, and it's really the, the whole entity behaving, even though we can go in 
and we can find little bits of biochemistry that mm. are involved in responding to one signal or another. But um, so I would say there's a kind of proto agency mm. there, and that proto agency gets elaborated through evolution to ultimately what we have in us, which is, you know, just for convention's sake, I I talk about free will in humans because it's a term that people use, but it has a lot of phys- philosophical baggage, of course. Yeah, um, and I think that you know applying it to other animals isn't isn't necessary it just opens up a lot of philosophical Mm. um, objections really and i think the term agency is more neutral um, and is perfectly well applied to like i said even single organisms i mean if you look in a bacterium for example they you know they can sense things in their in their environment they move around um in response to that and and that's that's an informational kind of effect Right, they're not being pushed by things in the environment, mm. detecting them, and then they're got the receptors. They give a little wiggle inside, so it's a just a conformational change that the organism that that means something to the organism, and they may be configured in such a way that they will tend to move towards a food source or move away from something bad. And if you just do experiments in the lab, you know, the kind of experiments that have worked out these pathways, the way those are set up is that they hold everything constant. Right, they're completely controlled environment except for this one thing that they're hmm. exposing the, the bacterium to, and then you can work out the pathway, what proteins are active, this little chain from the from the receptor to some signal transduction proteins to the motor that determines whether it goes this way or that way, and it looks like a very dedicated linear hardwired kind of circuit, but partly that's just a forced perspective because we designed the experiment to exclude all other all other variables and uh, nature doesn't do that right so the bacteria right. in nature has to respond to loads of things it integrates all kinds of signals good and bad hmm. it integrates them over time right that's yeah. how it knows if it's moving up a gradient or down a gradient so it's using its own recent history and it, it it's context dependent based on things like temperature and cell hmm. crowding and osmolarity and lots of other conditions so really it's a it's it's not a passive stimulus response machine. Mm. It's a proactive, uh, endogenously active holistic system that is integrating all this information and deciding the best thing to do. And even in that simplest scenario, I mean, it's one of the simplest behaviors really that we know about, um, that integration and holism is at play. And that's why I think it's legitimate and reasonable mm. to ascribe agency of some at some level, right? The most yeah. primitive level to the whole thing, to the entity, because it's the entity that's doing things. It's just the the biochemistry is what it's using to do that. Yeah, I like your approach a lot. I think it's very similar to how I approach the problem of consciousness in my recent book, uh, Philosophy for the Science of Animal Consciousness where I essentially try to connect evolution of consciousness with agency. So I tell, in a way, a very similar story where I argue, look, uh, across evolutionary history, we have to recognize that there has been an increase in agency. Um, Organismal systems have become more independent, have gained more control over their own lives, and I try to make this, uh, at least in principle, mathematically operationalizable by expressing this in uh, in, a, in terms of an extended life history theory, behavioral mm-hmm. and state-based life history, where you can include all the trade-offs organisms have to face during their lives, right? And for some organisms, they don't just have to solve um, perhaps one very complex problem um, across a lifetime, but they face routine problems in their own decision right and it is here that i've argued a special kind of agency arises that makes the kind of hedonic common currency form of evaluation worth having where we have systems like dopamine uh, operating Mm -hmm. um, alongside with uh, more complex brains that help organisms to make these decisions in efficient ways and while i didn't go into the question of free will in my book here because it would have opened so many more questions i really think that this probably can explain uh, 
why there are systems that can be reasonably described as having free will, or at least are much freer than systems that don't have that. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. And I think, um, you know, what's interesting is that that this idea of formalizing the degree of autonomy mm. of a system is really interesting. And, you know, I sometimes get challenged when I use words like saying, you know, that these systems have been elaborated or they get more sophisticated or more complex <clears throat> as they sound a bit vague. But of course, you can put numbers on them, right? Mm. You can measure some things. And one of the things that's interesting to think about is, you know, if you think an organism has a, a control system to control its behavior, it, basically it's trying to make happen what it wants to happen, yeah. right? You know, the future, lots of things could happen and it wants to make this one thing happen, right? But right now, and, and many organisms do that, right? They act right now to make this happen right now. But uh, as, as things get more complicated, they develop the ability to plan, right? Mm. Over longer timeframes to affect the future over much longer timeframes, really long for us, as it turns out. And that, I think, is a measurable kind of a thing. It's a, an, an autonomy from the immediacies of the environment mm. and a greater control of future states, depending on your own states and your own actions. And that, for me, makes a lot of sense. And I think it's funny that you say that you you know avoided free will a bit in your book, because I avoided consciousness a bit <laughs> in my book um, for the same reason that it opens up a whole other can of worms, right? But I think the right th way to think about consciousness is from the point of view of what, what does it get you mm. in a control system, right? What does it add? Yeah. And, and one of the key points, you know, you referred to these uh, hedonic systems, these val evaluation systems, where you need to kind of have a common currency and bring things together into a common space. That, for me, is really key. And it's an argument that I think you know, pushes back against the idea that you could just pre-configure a system hmm. such that the way that it was configured right now would, in some hard-coded way, determine its behavior in every scenario that it, it would then encounter. Because it can't, right? I mean, there's just not enough information in, in its past experience to account for every novel combination of variables in hmm. every scenario the thing would, it would encounter. So there's a reason that cognition evolved. It's precisely to enable that flexibility. Yeah. You mentioned that even with bacteria, when we do yeah. experiments about the decision-making, we typically simplify the environments to perhaps only include two variables, and then Absolutely. we change them. But for the actual environments, say animals face, but even bacteria, they're vastly more complex, and we get this wrong impression from a lot of animal cognition research that the problems of animals are fairly easy and all that they would require in terms of cognitive hardware is actually not that complex. What role could consciousness play here? Mm -hmm. But that's just, yeah, perhaps more of an experimental artifact because the actual natural lives are vastly more complex. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, what's funny is that, um, you know, it's, it's perfectly understandable that people working on experiments and working in the lab do nice, tight, mm. controlled experiments, right? That's they, they take a reductive, a methodologically reductive approach. Unfortunately, that sometimes leads to a theor theoretical reductive right. view, right? Where they're saying, just because we can only do experiments like this, we should think that the system is like that. Or they don't even, I mean, it's just sort of implicit, right? It's a tacit move. Um of course, you can do the method methodological reduction without that commitment. But what's interesting is that even philosophers who have, when they're doing thought experiments mm. <laughs> with no budget, um, <laughs> uh, they nevertheless still often constrain things. You know, the, uh, thought experiments about free will, they're usually, it's a binary choice. You're either doing yeah. A or B in an instant, right? Which is such an impoverished kind of view of behavior mm. because our behavior really, you know, what makes animals successful is not this, we don't go through life just momentarily choosing between binary. Mm. We have this array of, of things all the time. We're managing our behavior through time. And in this nested kind of a way where, you know, we have ongoing activities, we have plans and policies and commitments and goals that are uh, over extended timeframes. And given all of that, that contextualizes and constrains and informs the actions that we choose, you know, in, in mm. shorter time frames. So, um, yeah, I think we just need to move to this this richer kind of 
more realistic view of behavior and behavioral control that is not just momentary momentarily reacting to stimuli in the in the mm. environment and in the animal in the animal behavior research science fields there has been quite a bit of a conflict between the more traditional behaviorist oriented animal behavior researchers and then the ethologists who really try to observe the richness of animal behavior in its natural environment because only there can you really see um yeah which behaviors really evolved for these uh, natural settings and yeah. if you just study animals in these very constrained situations perhaps they've grown up in developmentally uh, not very rich uh, experiences right so they're yeah. already perhaps uh, don't express as rich behaviors as the wild counterparts um i think here it's really important to have this combination right of these different um, yeah. scientific approaches Absolutely. I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing the controlled experiments in the lab. Yeah. What, the, the the mistake is coming is thinking that that reflects behavior in, mm. in, in all its varieties, right? And that you know, be, any behavior beyond that is just the same thing, but a bit more complicated. But when you get into these kind of contextual relations, the the point is that it becomes unpredeterminable. Right. It, it, it just you have to go through the process of working these things out in order to come up with the the best behavior and the organism. There's not a right answer most of the time. It's just trying to optimize over loads of variables at once with with uncertain, ambiguous information in a still dynamically changing environment, juggling its own conflicting goals and so on. Right. Mm. So, so animals are just trying to do the best they can. But that involves cognition, really. Right. Not just sort of. Uh, this deterministic firing of neural circuits that some people argue because they're just it, it's it's sort of computationally undecidable or irreducible you just have to go through that cognitive process to get there which is why you know i argue very much that even though we can see of course these cognitive events rely on neural mechanisms um what happens is not driven by the neurons it's still up to the organism as a whole hmm. it's still a holistic view of cognition um as being a real thing that you can't eliminate you can't you can't reduce it to neuroscience now robert sapolsky is a neuroscientist who's defending uh for denial of free will of course yes. he had a very radical stance yeah how would yeah, he so respond to your argument well here? partly uh <laughs> Partly what I just said is a response to to Robert's arguments. <laughs> we, we've had a, a little debate recently. And um, mm. yeah, so Robert's view, if I can paraphrase him um, uh, fairly, I hope, is that neuroscience is revealing all of these mechanisms. And it seems like he thinks that every time we understand some new bit of neural machinery that's involved in decision making, the space for you to be in charge shrinks. Mm as if it, we've explained away another little bit of the person uh, in this process by reducing it to these, these neural machineries. And that's the view that I think is just a mistake. And you know, I would say the same thing in a bacterium. You can say that these, this, pro, this signal transduction protein being phosphorylated is part of the chain that drives motion in one way or another. Mm. But uh, it's a mistake to keep doing that in such a way that ultimately the entity dissolves, right? The thing that we're interested in just disappears as the object of study. And so, yeah, I think first of all, the the you know the neuroscience, it's it's just a kind of a strange dualism hmm. to think that if we see some neural machinery, then it can't be you. Like, what else would it be? Where right. else would you be? It it really reveals this idea mm. that one way of it, it's 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 a way of thinking that for you to be in charge, it can't be physically instantiated somehow, which is just weird, right? I mean, it's for a, it's a weird position for someone who's an avowed physicalist to take because mm. it's inherently dualist, right? The right, idea. a version of this argument perhaps that would work is that across the last hundred years of neuroscience, say, uh, we learned how much the brain surprisingly does without us being consciously aware of, that the majority of all this information processing is going on unconsciously, yeah. and the way we think about ourselves is we're this conscious decision maker. Yes. So 
So here neuroscience at least takes away at least some of our perception of ourselves as how free we really are. Sure. There's at least some part taken yeah. away. Right? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think that's reasonable, but there's different ways to think about that. So you can think that, okay, when I'm going to do something, some ideas just pop into my head and I have no idea where they come from really. I, I didn't consciously decide mm. to have the idea to do something or say something. Right? And I think that can be true without it meaning that you're not involved in that stage mm. of the process. So, you know, you can use words like unconscious or automatic, and that sounds very robotic, right? Yeah. And algorithmic. But if you replace that with a word intuitive, then it then I mm. think that better captures what's happening, right? Because we've gone through our lives We've learned from our experience in such a way that in many scenarios that are familiar to us, we don't have to think from first principles about what to do. We already have a decent idea of what to do because we've been paying attention to what worked well and what didn't well uh, work, didn't work well. So that um, you know our our subconscious circuits can suggest things to do, but but I would call that intuition because it's hmm. it's it's building on this. A body of knowledge that we have accumulated through yeah. our life, right? And it's really our body of knowledge that's driving those suggestions. It's not just neural firings. Right? Mm. So, and then, I mean, the other element of that is that that is not the end of the process because after we have some ideas suggested to us, there's this evaluation process where mm. we, you know, we try them out a little bit and, and sometimes that trying them out in our heads is also subconscious, but sometimes it's very overt and deliberative. And so we have a few ideas. We could do A, B, C, or D, and uh, and we sort of think, oh yeah, um, A would A would work out well because not because I've done that in this exact scenario before, mm. but this other scenario was kind of similar to it, and I did this similar type of thing, and that worked out well. So it's a sort of abstract, higher level cognition you can apply in that sort of scenario. Um, and that's you deciding, right? You yeah. know, so, so that's more this uh, two-stage model of free will that actually William James mm. proposed. Um, and I think it has a lot of a lot of merit to it. So yes, we do a lot of subconscious thinking. A lot of our motivations are, you know, arise from these ancient systems that are homeostatic systems, right? They're there to keep us alive. Um, you know, and tell us if we're hungry or thirsty or yeah. need of social contact or, you know, all these higher level things in humans too. Um, and then we we sort of operate with that information. Um, and yeah, that that's good, right? I mean, mm. it's constraining in one way, but it's informing in another way, right? If we didn't have those systems there and we had to think from first principles every time, like what, what should I do? What should I want to do? Right. What's my motivation yeah. here? Right. Um, well, we just wouldn't get very far. It just mm. too inefficient. Right. We'd be dead. Perhaps to bring Dennett's slogan in here of free will worth wanting, we might not be interested in a type of free will where we can just decide which desires or moods we have in a particular moment. Right. Or you're hungry, and then you maybe think of the options of different food items, and that's a free choice. But perhaps not so much that you're picking something to eat at all, but right? there's less freedom about this, perhaps. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's funny. I think, um, so D Dennett, you know, defends free will, but a compatibilist mm -hmm. person where he says it's, it's, it's a sort of a strange hybrid where he concedes that determinism is true, which is an odd starting point from my view, and that we don't really have choices in that there aren't future possibilities that are actually open, and yet, and yet we're still responsible for what happens because of this, what's called source causation, because everything that's going on in here is so complicated, as we discussed before, that it's really the whole entity that's that's mm. driving the decision, even if it was predetermined by that configuration. So I don't, I don't accept the premise that determinism is true to begin with. Um, but the other element there that's interesting from from dan is that he has another phrase which is nice which is competence without comprehension mm. and you know many organisms like our bacterium that we were talking about has competence without comprehension eventually we do develop comprehension you know that's what makes us different and we 
can, I would argue, choose what we want to do. I mean, this is a big, another big sort of um, argument against free will is that even if we can act on our reasons, we can do what we want, we can't want what we want. Mm. Let's go back to Schopenhauer and um, Sam Harris has articulated a lot, uh, Robert Sapolsky does as well, you would question where do your intentions come from? Mm. Uh, with the idea that, um, you know, the, the, that we have no insight into that. Yeah. Uh, we can't introspect about it and we can't make choices about it. But really, if we're choosing an intention, all we're doing is choosing a goal. And, you know, we talked earlier about these nested behaviors where we might right now be choosing a motor action, but that's part of an activity. It's part of an ongoing behavior. It's part of a longer term goal. And we choose those things as well. There's different parts of our brain responsible for choosing long term goals. So, you know, I, don't, I just think it's wrong to say that we can't choose what we want to do. I mean, mm -hmm. if I went out to play a round of golf, I would be choosing to want to put the ball in the hole. And then at any moment, I'd be wanting to put the ball in the hole because I chose to. Hmm. So um, it just seems an odd view, but I think it comes from this focus on momentary decision-making as opposed to sustained behavior through time. Hmm. Those are just different perspectives. And the sustained behavior through time, yeah. to me, is the right... But uh, you want to make room, at least, for weakness of will, presumably... Absolutely. That, right. Yes, sure. Yeah. And That's, um yeah, I'm not making an argument yeah. that we have complete control at all times. Right. <laughs> What I'm arguing for is that we have the capacity for control. Hmm. And um and that will be present to a greater or lesser extent in different circumstances. It's present to a greater or lesser extent in different people. Mm. Um, you know, adults have greater cognitive control than than children do. I mean, we talked earlier about your, you know, formalization of the degree of control yeah. that you have. I think we could definitely formalize that going mm. from infants uh, to younger children, you know, children to older yeah, to children. To note something here, I chose this formalization because it's basically economic theory applied to yeah. biological systems and in yeah. economics we're of course interested in agents making choices and okay. making different trade-offs right yep. and that's precisely the kind of agency we're interested in is something that evolves right yes. where biological systems themselves have to deal with these trade-offs calculate them and make decisions yep. rather than just have fixed responses so. but they do it in an informed way Right. Mm -hmm. So the idea of this this absolutist idea of free will, where uh, first of all, it's like some people say, well, it it only counts as free will if there's no prior causes whatsoever, yeah. which is a weird premise because it what would that be, right? What would an organism be that is behaving with no prior causes? That's no prior information, no prior uh, context, mm. no not taking anything in the world into account. Uh, not taking its own future goals into account because that's a prior cause. It would just be a random behavior generator. I mean, it is a quite, maybe the traditional view of free will is just inherently somewhat dualist, somewhat yeah, anti-naturalist, right? And it is. And, and I think what happens is that some people like Robert Sapolsky, for example, hmm. that's his target, right? His yeah. target is that view. And... <laughs> And in that, I agree with him. That's my target as well. Mm. That, that's just a, this magical, mystical thing that couldn't mm. exist. And, you know, what I wanted to do was find a naturalized way to think about behavioral control that doesn't rely on a little ghost in the machine yeah. or an immaterial soul, but that also, at the same time, doesn't um, eliminate the self, mm. which is this holistic entity that, that has continuity through time and that can't be just uh, thought of as a piece of machinery right? i think That's that the motivation by sapolsky is also partly political where there were some interesting uh, studies that have been done that show that people on the right seem to have much more uh, much more of a free, radical free will idea mm. that people are much freer in their choices and have to bear more responsibility for that. Yeah, yeah. Whereas on the left, it's more common to think, well, our choices are influenced um, to a large extent by also our external circumstance, by our environments, right? And then and part of the motivation is, well, I mean, I guess his view is a bit more radical than that, but 
that we might punish people too harshly for the choices they make. Yeah, no, absolutely right. And and you know what? I completely sympathize with his arguments about moral luck. Hmm. And, and, you know, especially in the American context where the the meritocracy is sort of fetishized hmm. uh, through a view that's just absurd. I mean, yeah. that, that, you know, the idea that anybody can make it, um, which is basically saying, you know, if you, you can be rich if you work hard. So if you're not rich, you must not have worked hard. So you deserve mm. to be poor, you know? Yeah. I mean, it just it is a bit absurd, but I think you can challenge that. You can challenge lots of aspects of, especially, you know, the particularities of American social systems mm. and and social beliefs without taking us uh, uh, an abstract metaphysical stance that's right. so absolutist <laughs> right and and so it comes down to this question can you admit that there are some influences on our behavior that constrain our degrees of freedom mm. while still allowing that within that space the organism the entity still has causal power to decide what to do right it's not infinite yeah it's contextualized and it's mm. limited um, that seems to me just a perfectly reasonable way of looking at things. And I think most people accept both that there are influences mm. and that the organism still has some. I think at least in a European legal context, it also seems more like that. We don't uh, take a radical dualist free will concept, yeah. really. There's lots of room for gradations. You want to have space for yeah, mental uh, conditions uh, psychiatric conditions um whether someone's drunk or not right yeah yeah, yeah. no absolutely and like i mean those examples are really clear because they show that we do have a pretty good concept that we have some control systems but they can be impaired right they're not magic control systems they're biological systems and they can be impaired by biological insults hmm. like drugs or like the system going awry because of a psychiatric illness so, yeah, I mean, it's funny. I think the the systems that we have in place, especially the formalized ones in the legal system, already recognize gradations of free will. They yeah. recognize that circumstances, both I internal to, to the person, but also external circumstances, can infringe on um, the degrees of freedom that somebody has. And... Yeah, like I said, there's you, you can rail against the meritocracy and other social injustices, especially in the American penal system, without having to rely mm. on this idea that nobody has any free will ever. Because actually, if you go there, then it doesn't almost doesn't make sense to take situations into account and mm. circumstances. Like, why? What are you talking about? No one. Every action is predetermined. What does it matter what somebody's background was? It's it just like if every action is predetermined, then there's not there's just things that are just going to happen. So it almost um, defeats the argument I think that he wants to make, hmm. which I which I agree with the basic idea that we should take people's circumstances into account. Of course, we should. Yeah, there was one thought I had. So I, um, if you think of perhaps. A spectrum from aphantasia where if you go into your own introspection try to imagine um, a red apple or the taste of some particular food item for aphantasics that's typically not possible and then uh, that comes obviously in degrees and while i don't have the complete lack of mental imagery i certainly struggle to mentally compare two different food items on a menu and if i go to restaurant again i'm like ah maybe i should just pick both then I taste both. And even then, it's pretty hard to make the comparison. I wonder if that undermines free will to some extent, because this ability to have the mental comparison is um, yeah. Yeah, a bit reduced. Well, it's, I mean, it, so that particular example, um, I'd have to think about that. Mm. One, but, but more generally, the idea that, you know, I mean, that you you picked out a difference in perception, right, between mm -hmm. people. And, and that, I think, is really interesting and, and key. And it's very much not appreciated how how different we are in the way that yeah. we perceive the world, just in our actual senses. But I would say also in the way that we perceive things, say, as rewarding or not mm. rewarding. So you might, you know, if you've ordered the... Uh, 
the chocolate fondant. And <laughs> you, it and you, go, you, know, you might be like, eh, it's okay, but I might love chocolate. I mean, chocolate might be super rewarding for me. So not only are we sensing the world differently, we're feeling it. We're mm. feeling it differently. And that is going to, uh, in part, depend on our, you know, the way our brains were wired, our genetics and development, and and so on, um, but also on our experiences that we've that we've learned from. So, you know, in thinking about um, this, I, you know, the tendency we have to judge other people's behavior, if we only do it from our own perspective, then I think that is unfair. Right. Mm. If if we don't realize that, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't have acted like that. And I don't think they should have. But yeah. but in fact, they felt that as more threatening than I would have, or they feel that as mm. more rewarding than I would have, or their risk aversion is just lower than mine or whatever it is, right? So if you can take that into account, um, then I think you get a better understanding of someone else's. Mm. I mean, how that affects moral judgments and so on is a, is a sort of an, another step beyond that but definitely the the variation that we see in human faculties which is basically what my previous book innate was about um is far greater than people appreciate mm. and of course it's what i just said is a challenge right to to take <laughs> into account that someone might be thinking of things or feeling things from a different perspective than you it's not easy to do that either but um but yeah there's just a lot more variation than people mm. Really? Yeah, I wanted to lead the discussion here because of your work on synesthesia, right? In my book, um, I'm not only interested in animal experience, but the goal is to move away from a view of consciousness as this all or nothing property and rather recognize phenomenological complexity that can differ in various dimensions, right? If you think about, I don't know, the the perhaps smell capacities of dogs being much richer of that of humans, Yet, our olfactory bulbs are actually larger. So, theoretically, it should be a, we should be able, if we trained our noses more, perhaps, to have just as rich smell capacities. Um, nevertheless, the, the goal really was to recognize that the experience within humans is going to be much more diverse than we might perhaps expect. And so, if we try to map out animal experience, we might also um, gain a better understanding of, yes, this diversity of uh, human experiences so perhaps you could explain what synesthesia is yeah yeah sure so i mean you you referred earlier to aphantasia which yeah. is one of these um experiences where people have a gradation in how much mental imagery they can conjure up um and that's one example of lots of different conditions um that have a name that uh that people vary in across the population and synesthesia is another it's it's typically known as a mixing of the senses and there are some versions that are very overtly perceptual, where, for example, when people hear music, they might see colors, colored shapes, like little pink clouds or little blue stars going off in their in their uh, field of view, like really, really having a visual experience. Um, and there's a whole load of kind of varieties of that. I spoke a little while ago to some uh, a couple of people who see auras around people. Mm -hmm. so they And they really do see it like the guy who was looking at me i asked him what color my aura was it's a sort of a response to somebody's personality and yeah. how, they, how they feel about them and i was sitting in the glare of a window and he had to move to get a good look at it right like it was a visual object that was being affected by other light in the individual scene hmm. so so um so sometimes people have these very overt perceptual experiences and i mean another example would be people who taste words where every word, not every word, but many words that they say conjure up a real taste, vivid taste percept that they're experiencing in the moment. Um, so there's lots of types of synesthesia that are like that. And then there's another type which is more conceptual, where, for example, um, letters of the alphabet, people might know that they have a certain color. And some, some synesthetes would see the color, right? If they're looking at what for me would be black text mm. you might actually see it uh, out there as colored others uh might just it it might just be a kind of a knowledge of that it's an attribute of the letter a or b or c right so which is interesting because as we're learning things like letters 
it's a it's really weird artificial construct right so we have these little squiggles these squiggles of different shapes and we're going to connect those to this arbitrary set of sounds which are our speech mm. sounds in, in a particular language and so we learn a you know this shape is a or it's a but this this little shape is also a or a and this shape when it's in this font or that font is also a or a yes. so there's a whole sort of concept that we have to build up about this object this cognitive object called a letter and it involves lots of different shapes and lots of different uh, versions of the sound but they're tied together right so those two attributes mm. are part of the concept of the a right and what synesthetes do is that they add another property into that concept mm. they add color or they may add uh personality for a lot of you know personal numbers with personalities for example is a common form or things like spatial location so for many synesthetes they'll think of numbers or letters as having a, a position in space relative to their body um, days of the week months of the year and so on so it's an interesting window into the way that we go from percepts to concepts concepts of objects which gather together the the attributes that they have and um i mean what has made it fascinating for me as a geneticist and developmental biologist is that it's genetic right it's it's strongly heritable mm. it runs in families and um and it also seems to be developmental in that people who have synesthesia typically say that they've always had it it wasn't you know acquired after some injury or something um in fact, it's and it's so implicit that many people with synesthesia don't realize that the way they're seeing the world is any different from anybody else. And I would bet that some of the people listening to this right now are saying, what's he talking about? Everybody <laughs> has letters. Everybody knows A is blue and B is green or whatever. Right. And that um, so. Yeah, so it's a fascinating, fascinating condition, both mm. in terms of you know, neuroscience and, and genetics. Um, but also philosophically in terms of perception, mm. uh, the, the idiosyncrasy of perception mm. um, and lots of other lots of other elements. Yeah, that's why people often assume that the way they experience is just the way others experience it. So when my yeah. now wife uh, told me uh, to imagine, I think it probably was a red apple because that's a famous example. I was like, you mean... It, you mean it as a metaphor, right? In in my mind, I you don't mean actually mean conjuring up the image. Yeah, yeah. I was like, what? And then I went down into the research in this area. Um, yeah, I sometimes like to think of synesthesia as perhaps the if you think of it on the scale, then aphantasia is here and synesthesia is here because synesthetes often report to have extremely rich memories of their past. Now, yeah, might be unrelated, um, but it seems like maybe there's just something about the the senses uh, playing such a bigger role in your life that that influences how you store information. Yeah. Uh, whereas I mean, for aphantasics, they often think more in terms of concepts, abstractions. Yeah. yeah, and I think I mean, first of all, let me say this. There's so much that we don't know about what's yeah. going on in synesthesia, but also it's it's quite a variable spectrum as mm. well. So there are studies, for example, showing synesthetes on average have better visual imagery, right? Mm -hmm. More intense, more vivid visual imagery. Um, that's a study um, was done here in Dublin, but uh, you know that's it, it may not be a universal truth about right. all all synesthetes. But I think what's really interesting, if you look at some of the literature in like philosophy of mind, hmm. uh, some of the arguments I think that you see may be because the people who are making the arguments just to have completely different ways of seeing the world. Like right. you can read it with, okay, you know what, this person must have a fantasia because yes. they're just denying the idea of mental representations. And it may be just hmm. because they can't visit themselves, bring up the image of something. So I wonder how much, I mean, it's to me, you know, sometimes a lot of philosophy to me looks like crafting arguments to defend an intuition mm. that, that somebody has. At least historically, I think that's very yeah. true because philosophers in quadra methodology used to much more rely on their own introspection 
yeah. rather than try to draw on a lot of science and integrate that. Now that has changed quite a bit, obviously, over the last yeah. um, decades, but yeah, at least but historically. I, yeah, but it's, it's interesting to go back and yeah. look at those historical things and say, I wonder, you know, maybe this difference between people sort of explains mm. this, this disagreement and that the, the, they're both right. Yeah, was, They're just talking about different aspects of human experience. It seems like someone like William James had a very rich subjective experience right yeah. and then yeah. maybe someone like hume maybe not so much maybe hume had aphantasia um but yeah i wanted to give an anecdote here because i was at a smell conference in tanzania where you might have heard about a popo as an organization that train uh, these african pouch threads to find bombs in former uh, war regions and they're really good at it uh, better than metal detectors often um because metal detectors, of course, find all kinds of metal, but these pouch threads are really trained to find bombs. Um, but one of the invited speakers was a former nurse called Choice, who has synesthesia, but has this extremely rich sense of smell, where the smell also appears as colors. Mm. But because she worked as a, uh, as a nurse, she noticed that her husband at some point had this very strong smell, and it... And she realized it's the very same smell patients um, in the hospital had. I think it was Parkinson. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that made her realize you can actually detect at the early stage of some diseases before any other medical tests are able to um, yeah. yeah get close to this. And so now they've actually train some rats in trying to find signs of tuberculosis before any other medical tests can find them so this richness of subjective experience can uh, really help us there but yeah as you mentioned the genetics are, have a crucial role here because her grandmother had the very same ability and she had to teach her granddaughter when she was very young how to deal with the sensory overload mm. these colors coming into your experience mm. of smells being represented by that and yeah her daughter i think has the same ability but apparently it's only um in the woman in the in my mm. family not the males apparently no. yeah there's a there's a, an open question about um sex differences in synesthesia yeah. so some early early studies including ones that we did found quite divergent mm. rates of prevalence of, of synesthesia in women much more than in men i think uh, i'm not sure where that stands at the moment my feeling is that some of that was methodological um yeah. and but it may be at least i think a two to one difference oh. you know and not that's not unusual in the sense that many um uh conditions uh, have sex differences mm. uh, between them i mean lots of diseases and disorders have as well so yeah there's all sorts of stuff that goes into um you know making an individual brain and supporting an individual mind that is completely idiosyncratic and um hmm. will never be will never be seen again and i think that's just uh, to me that's a that's kind of a joyous um fact to realize hmm is that um, you know every individual really sees the world in a way that no one else does yeah. in its full uh, breadth. And perhaps that helps. Perhaps uh, yeah, attack the motivation for some of the arguments by say Thomas Nagel and what it's like to be a bat that we could not possibly imagine what it's like to be some animal, because some humans can echolocate and others clearly have these extremely rich senses yeah. of smell maybe dogs actually also have a kind of synesthesia where some of the smells might appear as colors right yeah i mean we certainly it it is imaginable right i mm -hmm. mean and we, and we we can here we have been doing it imagining other people's perceptual experiences that may be quite different from our own um so yeah i don't i just don't accept the idea that we can't imagine what it's like to be a bat uh, or something else. But also I don't accept the idea that there's nothing it's like to be a bat or any other mm. animal. I mean, I would be much more in favor of the view that I think you would be defending as well of a graded kind of um, phenomenal consciousness, not just a graded access consciousness yeah. or, or sort of computational operational mm. level 
but that it feels like something. And um, I think, you know, Mark Soames has done some really interesting work on this. I don't know if you know his book, The Hidden Spring, mm -hmm. where, um, you know, he talks about the basis for at least the reason for having some qualitative feel to things is that we have these all these different uh, motivational uh, monitors of, of different states, and they are going to give us motivational signals that say, nope, this one's a little bit out of kilter. You have to bring your blood sugar up or you have to get your sleep, uh, sleep debt paid or, or whatever it is. Um, but, but those have to be submitted to a central evaluative system because those goals may conflict, right? So you may need sleep, but you also may need to eat. So which is it gonna be? You have to decide, the organism has to decide. And in order to do that, it has to bring in these um, sort of weighted signals that have, they don't just have a valence. It's, they're not just good or bad. They also have a feel to them so that the organism can keep track of whether it's a hmm. signal or a sleep debt signal that it has to deal with. And so I think he makes a good argument there, just from a kind of a control system point of view, that you would need to have a different feel to those kinds of signals to, to keep them separate. Uh, what, what, what it doesn't explain is why they feel like that. Right. Why they feel the way they do, right? The idea that they should feel like something and that they should feel like something different from each other, I can, I can get. Hmm. Um, the explanation of why they feel the way they do, hmm. that's just a lot trickier. Yeah, my view is quite close to his qua trying to find the origins of consciousness in evaluation. And that's an idea that probably goes back to Darwin and Romanus. Uh, the closest to my view is probably the, I think, uh, French-Canadian neuroscientist Michel Cabanac, who mm -hmm. argued that consciousness probably arose out of this hedonic common currency where we get pleasure from yeah. um, versus yeah for Mark Sorms I think he really likes this idea of the free energy principle doing a lot of the explaining there versus I I don't really see the added explanatory value there I think he could have cut that out of yeah. his book um, where I think it's much more of a Darwinian explanation where the way particular stimuli are presented to you in your phenomenal experience probably has something to do with the functional role so colors are not just neutral there's probably something about colors like red that just helps to signify importance which mm -hmm. is why bees say see colors of flowers and these particularly vivid um yeah forms right flowers in a sense evolved to attract bees right yeah, yeah. um yeah, but I think it's very important to to take evaluation very central here, that yeah. there is an agential evaluation going on. And it doesn't mean that everything is going through the central decider, that there's this Cartesian agent that yeah. would be computationally not viable. But yeah. it doesn't mean that there's some yeah intermediate here where there's still um, yeah something like a... Uh, common neural pathway where these decisions nevertheless have to be made yeah i mean i think you hit upon something really important there which is the to get away from this idea that all the information gets funneled up to this yeah decide, like the prefrontal cortex right <laughs> it just decides everything and you know the way i see it is much more of this sort of ongoing conversation mm. across levels where the top levels are saying well yeah. here's my current, here's my current goals providing some context to the lower levels but then the sensory information is coming in and saying, nah, nah, hang on, wait a second. Now mm. that's fine, except that I think there might be a tiger over there. So maybe we yeah. should change our goals. Um, and and so you get this sort of dialogue where each of the each of the levels is kind of trying to satisfy its own constraints that are being in, a, in part communicated to it by the other parts of the thing. So it's a much more recursive, integrative, mm. multi-level. Uh, consensus that's reached on the best thing to do given all of these nested constraints and all of the current information and so on um, that feels more naturalistic and it also gets away from this infinite regress where mm. you end up with this dualist idea where like okay why stop here no i'm not going to stop here i'm going to come out right the mind, the mind is going to float up here somehow mm. um, and if instead of that you have this recursive 
um, integrative architecture, which I think just is the way the nervous system is mm. set up. I mean, there's just tons of neural evidence for that being a good way of thinking about it. Then it it gets away from the little Cartesian theater and the little man in there with his hands on the controls and so on. Mm. Yeah, I think the yeah, time perhaps is a very important variable that we perhaps don't think enough about, right? That given how we evolved, or at least for Maybe humans, there's a special story to be told, at least in in my framework, where I try to link the evolution of consciousness and agency to these life history trade-offs. And certainly, in terms of human evolution, once we started to engage in barter, trade, um, had these longer commitments where we had to think about how an exchange with some person might pay off in the far-off future... But here it might be useful to actually move away from a more hedonic kind of evolution, uh, evaluation towards some kind of more abstract values that we can put on things. Yeah. And that perhaps explains why there's this kind of there's these common distinctions like type one and type two thinking, thinking fast and thinking slow, yeah. cold yeah. and hot systems, right? Um, that that could explain why we can engage in this very abstract form of thinking as well. But then there can be frequent conflicts between these two systems yeah. because we, we weren't evo uh, designed by natural selection from scratch to deal with these abstract economic problems, right? Yeah, yeah. And now these two systems conflict with each other. Yeah, no, I think that's, I mean, I, I agree completely. I think that that idea that we can build on our systems for um taking multiple motivations and, and juggling between them and, you know, to short and long-term goals. And, and we have this capacity to do it ad, ad libitum, right? I yeah. mean, we can just keep going in terms of the time frame, right? And so we can, in a, yeah, in an abstracted, rational way, think about, um, you know, making an investment in something, right? And putting money into my post mm. office account even though that hurts right every month i could use that money i could do something with it right now but i know i'm going to get some re return and i'm going to need it in the future um, and that's a kind of a cold reasoning right um it still i think will use some of the same uh, value systems it's just probably they're not felt in the same immediate hmm. emotional way right there's a more of an abstract valuation that we can recognize um and yeah, that that becomes, I think, you know, one of the things that makes human civilization and culture possible, because we're able to think about those mm. things. We are, as you mentioned, able to keep track of reciprocal exchanges and relationships and debts and who's paid what and who owes what, um, you know, the basis of, of social cohesion and cooperation if we didn't have those systems to keep track of those things, there would be a limit to how complex any cultural system could could get. I mean, you know, we see these cultural systems in, you know, chimps, for example. They have they have familial relationships, and they have um, they have alliances, and they mm. have um, you know they have loyalties that, and, and, yeah. and so on, <laughs> right? All sorts of all sorts of intrigue. Um, going on, but they also have a lot of reciprocal uh, behavior where they're doing their grooming, they're sharing food and so on. Um, but, you know, there's a limit to the time frame over which mm. they can maintain those those images of who owes what to whom. Um, whereas the fact that we're our, our cognitive abilities are a bit more open ended probably is you know partly what led us uh, to, to be able to have human culture on the scale that we do mm. have. Yeah, trying to investigate um, the evolution of these capacities. I hope to address that in some future work eventually. Yeah. Maybe yeah, I'll need yeah. a research sabbatical for that at some point. Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose in the end of your book, you allude to AI and how the evolution of free will might help us there. And certainly if you think about this abstract form of evaluation where we are no longer as time-restricted, Typically, when we think about AI systems, we also think, oh, time frame shouldn't matter too much here. Certainly, if you want to use AIs for some particular human tasks, then we care about time, of course. But for something like general artificial intelligence, um, probably time isn't really as much of a factor here. And then it might look this kind of, if we create this artificial agency, it might look very different from us, right? Yeah. 
perhaps well, it could so, go into here. Yeah, no, I think that the time constraint is so, so important, right? And mm. there's an efficiency constraint as well, which I think both of those things drive natural agency and natural decision making. So what's different between us and many AI systems is that we don't have unlimited compute or we don't have unlimited energy. Yeah. Uh, we can't draw down the power of a small country just to train an LLM over mm. you know, some six <laughs> months. Or something, right? So, um, so organisms are faced with this um, cost efficiency trade-off all the time, which gives a which also gives a cost accuracy trade-off in their in their cognitive systems. So, what that means is that that um, as organisms go through life and they're taking in some information, there's a limit to that information. It's not it's not all the information out in the world. It's a filtered picture and it's a compressed picture right we don't even just from our retina actually even from the photoreceptors to the retinal ganglion cells of our retina two layers away hmm. we have filtered huge amounts of information of because why we don't care about the photons hitting our eyeballs who cares we want to make inferences about what they have bounced off of in the world before they hit our eyeballs hmm. And that means that we have to abstract, we have to um, actually integrate across multiple photoreceptors and say, okay, this one fired, but this one didn't. So maybe there's something out in the world where there's an edge of an object and then there's a you know a blank space or something like that. So we're compressing information all the time. And you know, people who train and design AI models will know that having a compression layer is really good because it forces the system to abstract the important mm. statistical regularities in the information and not overfit to arbitrary data, right? So it wants to find reliable patterns that are reproducible. Um, and that's what we want to do as well. That's what organisms need to do. They can't overfit to every data point. Um, it's just, it's energy inefficient, but it's also just not a good ecological strategy to do that. So compression forces organisms to become intelligent, right? It forces them to abstract the, the meaningful information, including things like the reliable contingencies in the environment between things, the reliable causal relations and sequences. So when A happens, B reliably happens after that, right? But only if C is also hmm. the case and so on, right? So you can build up more and more complex kind of pictures of causal understanding of the world. And of course, we don't do that passively just by being trained on all the words on the internet, for example. We do it by acting in the world. We, we, we causally intervene in the world and then we pay attention to what happens. And then we incorporate that into our model of the causal structure of the world. So, um, so there's that, right? So we need to compress for just energy efficiency. We just can't maintain a a huge, huge brain because nerves are really expensive. Um, but then also there's the time thing, right? So we have to make decisions quickly. We just like, it's more important sometimes to do something than to spend loads of time working out this long computation mm. uh, to come to the right decision. By the time that we've done that, it's not the right decision and right? something has changed. So, um, so we have this pressure to act quickly in in a time scale that's rel relative to the ecological pressures in the niche that we inhabit, right? And so if it's a very fastly moving dynamic environment, uh, then organisms are, are reactive and, and they predict over a short time frame mm. because all bets are off after that. Whereas for other organisms that have you know more control or longer time horizon, they may predict things over that longer time horizon. Um, but in this sort of nested way where they can also react to contingencies as they arise. So, yeah, I think both the, the compression and the time constraints are in that sense, the very things that force agents to become intelligent. Hmm. And I think that current AI systems don't have those pressures so much because they don't, most of them don't have to do anything in the world. They're just, I'm not, it's not a critic criticism. Yeah. They're just not designed to do that. Um, and what would be interesting, I think, was if you, th if you think about embodied agents hmm. that have some goals, they have some a reason to care about something, they can scaffold off of that basic goal to build more immediate proximal goals in, relative to things in the environment. Um, you know, I think if you build a system like that that has agency 
and make it compress and make it do things quickly, it may develop intelligence mm. that may emerge. I think you may have to, yeah, you may have to build agency in order and then let intelligence come out of it as opposed right. to trying to do it the other way around. Yeah, I think we again converge here at the end of my book. I also talk about that this might give us some clues for how we could build sentient conscious machines, AI systems, where we would have to build robots that also have to deal with these trade-offs. They they need to care about something in order to evaluate these things, com have them compete against each other. Um, and you don't really see that with the AI systems we're building because we're building them for such very different purposes, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, that, that said, I think we can take, you know, what's amazing is that we do have these things, like these large language models that are so, so impressive. Yeah. Right? Um, and what would be interesting, obviously, and you know, what people I'm sure are working on is taking that kind of cognitive machinery hmm. and hooking it up to something that's doing something in the world or maybe even in, in a virtual world. Um, and there, I think, you know, you, you, you might get once the... Hmm. Once the agency part of that is solved, you might get to not just artificial general intelligence, but artificial super intelligence. Mm. I, mean, I think that's a yeah, at least with how scenario. fast things are moving in the last oh. years. Uh, it's not it wouldn't at all be surprising if something like this happens in the next five years, right? Yeah, and I think you know the, I guess one of the upshots from probably both of our books is that there's no magic required here, right? Yeah. There just isn't a, a magic required for conscious experience. And there's probably not magic required for agency either, hmm. which means that those systems, there's a certain configuration that enables those capacities. Hmm. And we can understand what those systems look like. And in fact, I think we have a, a good understanding, of, you know, at the basic level um, for those things. And so there's no argument in principle, to my mind, that says you couldn't build in an artificial mm. system something that has the right kind of architecture and the right kind of relations and interactions with the environment through time. Again, time being a, a really important aspect mm. here where it would be a self, right? It would be an entity capable of intelligent behavior. Yeah. Suppose I would want to say that free will and consciousness are things we as individuals care very much about because they're so central to our own lives. Sure. But in a sense, the, these very good biological tricks evolution has come up with to deal with the problems we are facing, right? Um, that doesn't mean it would be uniquely special or magical to try to recreate this in artificial systems. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. And um there's obviously hosts and hosts of ethical issues around that mm. uh, bear um, discussion. But um, yeah, I'm not one of these people who thinks, oh, AGI is right around the corner. But I also wouldn't be hugely surprised yeah. if within, you know, within 10 years, we are seeing things that we would say are agents. Mm. And they're at, least, they're at least as intelligent as a mouse, say. Um, yeah, I think you get the same problem good. in these debates that people have this conception that there's some bright line that cannot be crossed um, when really there is no such a line. Yeah. We're going to develop artificial intelligence systems that are more agent-like and this, this degree of agency is going to increase. And yeah. Yeah. at some point we are going to... Uh, yeah, be, uh, I think, suspicious, at least, that perhaps we should have some types of perhaps more protection for systems that seem to have goals that care about things that could perhaps suffer, right? But there is not going to be a bright line that we cross here where everything is going to be clear. Yeah, I think that idea of the singularity is um, is interesting. And on the one hand, I think it's just not, yeah, it'll probably mm. be more gradual. Um, but I mean, on the other hand, some people would say, well, that's fine. But, you know, if you look across evolution, you had this gradual, gradual picture until mm. you got to us and right, then, the, yeah. and then a singularity occurred. And what's interesting to ask is like, okay, well, what, where did that singularity come from? Was it just, mm. was it just the biological changes between chimps and humans? Because 
humans were around, like modern humans, Homo sapiens were around for a long, long time uh, before we got any kind of civilization mm. coming out, right? And there wasn't any genetic changes that made a difference there. There was some cultural events that made a difference. And there was some kind of a snowball, mm. snowballing effect, presumably to do with the invention of language and the ability then for each of us individually to benefit from everybody else's thinking. Um, and so, you know, I, when people talk about the singularity, I like to say, well, we're it. Yeah, you're mm. looking. Um, but uh, it's interesting to ask whether that was a just biological or it was a cultural singularity yeah. that, that occurred. Um, yeah. And suddenly, even if the gradual change in evolution is very slow, the gradual shift in AI research might be extremely fast. Right? Well, yeah, things, <laughs> so, are, things are happening very, very fast now. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think this was a very interesting conversation uh, because yeah. I'm still recovering from the flu. I think we best end it here. Do yeah. you have any closing words? Um, no, I mean, it was really fun. And I, I uh, definitely am going to have to read your book, Walter, because I think um, the, yeah, like I said, I gave, I I took the, the coward's way out and mostly avoided talking about consciousness. Mm. In book, but um, it sounds like the two of them, you know, there's, there's parallel stories there that i think are really fascinating to consider together so yeah um anyway it's been, it's been thanks so much for coming on yeah yeah my pleasure thanks a lot and i look forward to meeting in person someday all right so thanks for our listeners i hope you enjoyed this episode and i hope i see you again <laughs>